Hello and welcome to another episode of Monday Markets. As always, you're brought to you by Woo. Links available in the description below. It's the most straightforward way to support the show, outside of liking these videos, leaving a comment, subscribing, so on and so forth. As an admin point, apologies that this video is late. Bit of a weird day, but I thought I'd catch up nonetheless. So if you're one of the late night owls watching this, I appreciate you. If you're catching up tomorrow, sorry this video was late. So we're going to go over BTC, ETH, and then some altcoins that have either strength and or interesting structure. On the BTC front, we have one week left until the monthly close. Anything eventful as before on the monthly would have to take place below 59k as a failed breakout signal or something of that nature. Other than that, we're around the all-time high and there's no other relevant levels uh, or resistance in this area. Uh, one thing that could become relevant is that if this monthly closes roughly as it is now, it would constitute an inside month, which is to say that the price action of April was contained entirely within the high and low of the preceding month of March. So then that would become, April would then become the inside month, and we would mark out the inside month high and the inside month low, if that were to be valid and set up appropriately in time for the monthly close. And then you'd get some very high time frame range sort of contextual levels to work with if appropriate. So for example, if the market were to then dip at the start of the month and in doing so sort of spike previous well the inside so imagine this is the close then you have your next candle and imagine it comes down and spikes the inside month low into an area of monthly support that would at least be some confluence for a high time frame buy setup targeting the inside month mid-range and the inside month high again we're slightly reaching here because realistically these aren't super important monthly levels but if we can get some confluence from the monthly time frame for setups on other time frames that would be helpful but bigger picture i still think 58k is the big pivot above it you're not going to get any particularly scary looking monthly setups uh, if we go below that would look like shit and then contextually if we get an inside month that's at least something to have on your charts just as a quick contextual consideration uh, the weekly time frame on the last episode of monday markets we discussed a sort of subtle market structure shift in the form of a lower low close we since then bounced and this week has started off very strongly. I still think the weekly time frame is one of the better time frames for a medium term directional bias. Uh, if this if we sort of zoom out and forget the local market structure shift, if this entire structure resolves as a sort of all time high consolidation before breakout. Uh, so the example would be 20k as we've discussed where the market sort of oscillated a little bit and took its time before breakout continuation uh, and then you can go back further if you'd like but if this is one of those type of scenarios uh, then you'd expect any type of so-called weekly resistance around the all-time high to get steamrolled and then we get the expansion into new highs and breaking this triple top as a result so from a trading point of view in terms of setups if that where to come to fruition, uh, you would expect month uh, weekly resistance to be broken. And I think the only argument uh, or the only levels that could constitute weekly resistance would be this market structure cluster, if you will, between 67 and 69k. Now, again, that's arguably a broad zone. I wouldn't even treat it as a zone. I'd treat, treat it as individual levels, 67.2 and 69k. Um, and that, as broad as it may seem, if we're talking about weekly time frame post-consolidation, all-time high trend continuation, uh, then this really isn't that broad because above 69k, the argument would become that the weekly market structure shift to the downside has been invalidated, weekly resistance has been broken, we're at the all-time high, full fucking send it. So at that point, even though the levels may seem broad, uh, the, the fact that you could contextually justify expanding your targets uh, makes it pretty actionable. So in the most straightforward sense, uh, if this is your resistance cluster, closing above it would then signal all-time high break continuation, and then you'd look to get a piece of that on the weekly close and or on lower time frames, targeting uh, a broader shift from consolidation into back into trend, okay? Uh, so again, sometimes you'll have levels that are particularly broad or close to the market or don't look particularly tradable, uh, but it's entirely a contextual consideration. In this case, I think you can rationally justify having 67 to 69K as a medium term level for bias, uh, because if that breaks definitively, even if your entry is late, or even if you follow the weekly close that closes significantly above the level or whatever else, uh, the expected move from a sort of two month consolidation at the all time high and a resumption of trend from 
consolidation would be big enough to justify taking some liberties or being a bit broad with uh, your entry. So, you know, it's like if the move is going to be very big, then you don't need to be early to that move is probably the simplest way I can explain it. Uh, but I still think on the weekly time frame, you know, if we're going to be getting levels from higher time frames, uh, we discussed how the monthly is more or less a wash unless things really start to look bad. And I think that out of all the higher time frames, the trinity of the monthly, weekly and daily, uh, the weekly is one of the better time frames. And I like 67.2 and 69K for medium term bias. Now, that doesn't mean if it retests, you have to sell everything and short and uh, become a perma bear. Uh, I, I just think in terms of where you crank the risk levers and manage your exposure, if you're interested in medium to higher time frame swing trading, um, this is kind of the best you're going to get from the higher time frame. So that's certainly what I'm paying a lot of attention to uh, this week and probably in the coming weeks as well, because we the, the weekly time frame can take its time from time to time. That's a lot of time. Um, the daily time frame, no matter how hard Don tries to fud it, <laughs> that's a joke, obviously, um, but the daily range low held uh, and we had some sort of choppy post liquidation price action, but this move has been very strong. Um, funding rates are also negative at this time. So we have a spot premium and or perps being aggressive or whatever combination leads to the perp price trading below the index price, which means you're paid to be in long position on perps at the moment, whatever that funding rate is. Um, if price continues to go up and funding stays negative and all spot stays at a premium, uh, again, whatever causes that relationship uh, to entail that the perp is trading below the index, uh, that usually ends in some sort of liquidation type of big candle to the upside. So that's something to bear in mind if that dynamic continues. Again, uh, funding related things don't always have to end in fireworks. Uh, sometimes things kind of just even out and peter out without a fantastic move in price. Uh, but this is still a dynamic worth monitoring. I think again, if we open up the chart feature on Velo and jump onto some of the lower time frames, I think there's some evidence that there are still sellers uh, in this market that are not having a good time, at least with this most recent move. Um, so you can see that aggregated funding is currently negative. And during this time, uh, for example, when we had the this sort of low time frame pop up, uh, open interest actually decreased and liquidations spiked at the same time. So those are positions being forcibly closed, specifically short positions uh, being unwound, hence the spike in liquidations. That's the forced closing and the decrease in open interest also reflecting that. So that's sellers taking some flack on this candle and generally suggests that there are still shorts left in this market. And if funding continues to be negative, again, it's not crazy at this point, but still that acts as some pressure. And if price action continues to go up, uh, then some more liquidations may be in order. But again, that's not something you can make a definitive statement on without monitoring it. Um, again, sometimes this thing just resolves in a very boring fashion, but just something to bear in mind. Uh, from a technical point of view, that makes this particular market juncture quite tricky um, because the range low bounce has been pretty strong. And if you're positioned there, then you're in a strong position at the moment. But in terms of fresh positioning, uh, if you give any weight to this weekly resistance, which I do at the very least, um, then this is contextually one of the less attractive areas to do business, as boring as it sounds. Uh, we're not at the extremity. Even if we, you know, if we zoom out, this entire period has been sideways, right? So how do we define this sideways period? Uh, we can simply take the extremity as far as support goes, the infamous range low at 62K, uh, and then take the highest close or resistance or whatever else. It doesn't really matter how you slice it. I'm going to take lowest close and highest close for consistency's sake. Um, and you get a mid-range at around 67K. It could be slightly lower, it could be slightly higher, depending on how you uh, sort of mark it. But in any case, you're reaching the point now from a fresh positioning point of view where you'd be closer to diddling in the middle than not, right? So extremity, good slash interesting, extremity, good slash interesting, but in the context of a broader consolidation, the sort of point of point of control, the midpoint, whatever you want to call it, uh, the equilibrium um, is less interesting from a trading perspective because uh, price is closer to fair value than it is at a premium or at a discount if you want to use that type of language. So that's not super helpful. We know that this is the midpoint of the range, even just by eyeballing this thing, you know, if you roughly take this as the highs, roughly take this as the lows, we're more or less in the middle, even if you sort of move the line around. So from a weekly trading show 
uh, perspective that there isn't a ton of business to be done here from a fresh positioning point of view unless you're already in position, uh, especially if we then give any weight to weekly resistance, which could end up being a complete nothing burger, but then you just flip and long the shit out of it, right? Uh, but if we add the weekly consideration, if it manages, to, it happens to be relevant, uh, then you sort of have a confluence of diddling in the middle plus at a weekly level. Uh, now again, this is BTC, we're near the all time high. It's not implausible for this thing to just like steamroll up and none of the TA levels matter. Um, but I don't think that's a, you know, that, that's, not a scale, that's not a strategy <laughs> at the end of the day, saying what's the point of levels if it's gonna go up? I mean, that can work if you're very aggressively trend following, but that's not the trading style that I employ and not the, you know, not the kind of stuff we talk about in general. Um, so unfortunately I have to be boring and talk about point of control, midpoint, the risk reward of doing business in the middle versus the extremities, so on and so forth. Uh, I've sort of gone back and forth also on the utility of the daily time frame. Um, I think at this point, uh, if the daily closes like this in 35 minutes, <laughs> um, it, it's a pretty decent daily close uh, because you will have, first of all, bounce from the range low, which is good. Uh, but I think in general, closing above this daily cluster here in one form or another, as broad as it is, uh, is a pretty pretty decent sign because that would have been the immediate uh, bearish retest level, right? Sort of weak bounce from the range low, you'd expect it to sort of get stuffed around 65K. You don't even have to box out the whole thing, right? You can in one form or another uh, use the former range low as a resistance, be anchored on this lowest close or this lowest close. If the market were really weak, uh, then you'd get a weak bounce from support that gets rejected immediately, but that's not what's happening at the moment. Um, so that's why this area is so meddlesome because low time frames and some higher time frame structure is like, yeah, we're bouncing and the bounce is strong and didn't get rejected at resistance. But then the more pertinent question, you're not trading the market when it was at the range lows, you're trading the market now. Your, your job is always to align yourself with where the market is at the moment. Uh, and at the moment, it is sort of diddling in the middle, range, midpoint, whatever type of structure. So um, less compelling from a in terms of doing business within this entire consolidation, right? Like if you're trend following, then diddling in the middle can be fine if you have some uh, trend levels that can justify an entry. But if you're dealing in the context of a broader consolidation, then it's really the extremities where you want to um, do most of your business. Um, and also bear in mind, I'm very self-aware about uh, Monday markets in general being like, yeah, this is a range low. And if it, you know, last time we spoke about, uh, I'd want a wipeout, like a proper failed breakdown at the level. And then if it gets back above, uh, that would be a interesting trade. Uh, for me, these moves here didn't really cut it. I was hoping we would really make a poke and even threaten a close below um, the range low. And to be fair, on that same show, I said, if it happens to just bounce and then go up from there, then, I mean, that's good for the market. But in terms of creating actionable trade setups for me personally, uh, I'd probably miss out on that. And that's pretty much what happened. Um, I was expecting slash waiting for, not even expecting, just prepared for and willing to trade a deeper spike of the extremity. And perhaps that was greedy, perhaps not. Uh, but this this wick uh, didn't really cut it for me. I was hoping we'd spend a bit more time there and have a sort of low time frame evidence of a failed breakdown. Uh, but this was very quick. You know, one candle, one or two candles, and then a bunch of wicks to go with it. So, um, again, this is where TA type of stuff becomes more an art than a science. Uh, there's no useful answer to the question of how deep should a failed breakdown go to be a valid failed breakdown. Uh, and in this case, uh, the most sober analysis is that uh, I was, I guess, too greedy slash misjudged what would constitute a failed breakdown versus not. But whatever, that's in the past. Uh, we're here now. The chances that I get a good setup at this weekly structure are generally quite low. Uh, so as prophesized in one form or another on Monday markets, if it bounced off the range low, I will, I'll probably just be like, eh, whatever, what's next? And so now that it's bounced off the range low, I'm eh, whatever, what's next? Um, I don't think there's anything else to add on other timeframes. Again, if you eyeball this thing, we've just been going, you know, compared to some of this price action, we can kind of draw a diagonal line through it of it going straight up. Uh, the past couple of weeks have just been very much range consolidation type of stuff. And when it's range consolidation type of stuff, I tend to be a lot greedier and stricter with entries and doing business in the middle of the range um, doesn't tend to be at the top of my list. Um, at this point, if there are if it does offer a failed breakdown, that's still tradable. Uh, if there's some sort of potential high or low dip that develops during the week, that's tradable. Um, 
if this is really the sort of all-time high acceleration, then there may be a breakout that's tradable. But right here, just fully realistically, there's nothing for me to do. And that's somewhat antithetical to what makes for good YouTube content in one form or another, because you want to convey to your audience that there's always a trade, there's always an opportunity, you always know what's going on, you always have an explanation for what the market is doing, what it's going to do next, but sometimes you kind of look at a thing and say, hey, this would be interesting, it doesn't happen, or you fuck up the entry, you fuck up the execution, or you miss it, or skip it, or you oversleep, and you think, ah, well, that's done, uh, and now I have to wait, and that's the reality of trading, so as unattractive and not particularly sexy as it is, hopefully that can convey some sort of utility to someone um so yeah that's btc let me know if that was even remotely helpful um on the eth front eth btc can't be forced to care about it still um i don't think anything has changed and this has been a very much a pain trade i think for much of uh, our colleagues and the crypto twitter in general you know if, if this thing reverses eventually in whatever form that takes might be interesting or if we get sustained weeks of upside that would also be interesting if we get a rip the band-aid off type of move that would be interesting but this thing has been anything but interesting for the longest time i mean all of this this entire downtrend starting from 2022 realistically uh, has been very technical but also just not particularly um, in line with what you, you might infer from sentiment. So not going to spend too much time there. On the ETH USD front, the weekly time frame uh, managed to close above one of the levels that we discussed, which is this 3K. Uh, you'll remember the Don meme of 2, 3, 4K for ETH. Uh, and it seems like on a weekly closing basis, uh, support, or at least this version of round number support, is still holding so no huge changes there uh, the daily time frame here is pretty messy we sort of talked about it on monday markets and also talked about the extremity in the form of this cluster at 2900 to 3k that has generated now a decent bounce uh, but again if you weren't there for the bounce at this point chasing the bounce unless you have very high conviction in new highs or kind of breakout attempts um, most of that finagling will have to be done on lower time frames and the sort of maximum risk to reward opportunity has sort of moved on. I guess one thing upon reflection that I appear to be wrong about, unless I'm very premature about it, is that post large liquidation flow tends to be a bit choppy and a bit messy. Uh, if this thing continues to walk up, uh, then that will obviously be wrong. And the prevailing thesis will be mega wipeout into mega trend continuation. Uh, and if that's the case, I will be poorly positioned for it. And if poorly positioned, by poorly positioned, I mean not positioned at all. Um, but if that call ends up being wrong, then c'est la vie. You know, sometimes you have to make a bet on what kind of market conditions you're going to get after a big move. Um, and if it's a case of V reversal people winning and slow heavy flow type of arguments losing, then I guess I will have to just wait for another trade, which isn't the end of the world. Uh, I'm not particularly interested in shorting crypto unless I get really good monthly time frame signals. And even then, I'd be very, very careful. So at most, uh, if I get something wrong in the market, it's missing out on N degree of upside versus losing money, uh, which isn't which isn't too terrible. Maybe that's coped, but uh, I guess this is one of those things where your risk appetite and your preferences and your trading style are very much impacted by your history and just your age and financial preferences and where you are in life. Uh, at this point, I'm not super interested in trying to milk every single cent possible from every single move. Um, I'm going to be very picky, greedy, and look for sitter type of home run media you know medium time frame swing opportunities and if that means long periods of uh getting no fills and or not being positioned i'm personally okay with that but if it's your second cycle or even first cycle and you see an abundance of opportunity then i would understand yeah if you were if you were to see that as a loss and would be more inclined to trend follow more aggressively i'm just at that point uh, through luck privilege and whatever else that i don't i don't feel the need to force things or try to be on board every single move. So uh, always bear that kind of context in mind whenever you're either reading my tweets or consuming anyone's content, as a matter of fact. When it comes to Twitter, there'll be a huge divergence uh, between people who are just kind of generally comfortable and trade very selectively versus those much, much more aggressive in the in the sort of building phase and trying to make the most of market conditions at all times. So a bit of a rant there, but um, maybe it resonates. Uh, I'd rather just be honest, even if it's boring, than be dishonest if it's more entertaining. Um, 
yeah, I think we talked about ETH bounce from the daily cluster uh, at a decent spot from there now. In terms of chasing it or doing whatever else, I don't like lower time frames on ETH. So it's one of those things where if you took some risk on the daily cluster, great, good for you. Uh, and if you didn't, I'm not sure at this point whether there's anything particularly interesting, similar to BTC, to be honest. Um, and not particularly interesting doesn't mean untradeable. That's just a reflection of my admittedly sometimes too strict filter for what constitutes a good trade. So again, if you're sort of hungry, profit maxi trading a lot, then your filter slash bar for what constitutes a good trade will be different or potentially even lower. Uh, whereas in my case, unless I really, really like something, uh, I'm not going to punt it. And if I miss out on something, I'm not going to chase it because I kind of, you know, it's not in my remit and not in line with my goals, so to speak. Again, just trying to be fully transparent. Um, altcoins are in a very interesting spot. Some bounced very hard and have formed decent structure as a result. Uh, so the reason I've included some of these is that let's say the post liquidation heavy flow type of argument is wrong from last Monday markets. Let's say that the low probability of a V reversal argument from last Monday markets is also wrong. Let's suppose that the potential weekly resistance argument for BTC is also wrong. Let's just assume I'm just wrong about everything all the time. Um, one way that that could play out is that BTC just keeps marching up and strong altcoins selectively, and there's a lot of dispersion at the moment, but strong altcoins keep being strong. Uh, what do some of those look like in terms of structure and the potential invalidations that they offer? Uh, I've just put, uh, I've made a list here of Nier, Pepe, Say, Sheeb, Solana, and Whiff, um, because they have those types of structures, which would at least afford you some degree of invalidation uh, if you're looking to position for aggressive trend continuation as opposed to boomer cred, boring market take type of thing. Uh, most of these are fa fairly self-explanatory. The prevailing structure is that the markets had a breakdown and have since reclaimed that breakdown. So you're looking for an invalidation either at the extremity uh, if you're taking a wider swing approach or closer to the breakout level uh, if you're short to medium term trading. So purely in terms of technical structure, sort of ignoring BTC directional bias or if it just continues to rip phases or whatever else, just, just from a purely chart point of view, uh, I've included the near daily time frame failed breakdown, which I think has a really nice cluster uh, at around $6. So 5.9 and 6.1, you can split that and just get six. Um, very technical sort of Clear cluster, a couple of bounces, breakdown, uh, sure a lot of liquidations on this day, sort of consolidates and doesn't go anywhere and then pops uh, back above. Again, from a local point of view, you could always make the argument, yeah, but it's reached some sort of extreme, local range higher, whatever else type of thing. Uh, but again, what we're trying to account for for these setups is what if the, what if shit continues to melt up and, you know, this ends up at the highs um, like the rest of the market, you know, what is the technical setup or at the very least where, where is the invalidation uh, for these types of moves? And I think sub 5.9k would be bad uh, above 5.9k, 5.9k, Jesus, uh, $5.90 is, yeah, above, fine, below, bad. So you have sort of an invalidation um, that's very clearly defined from the technicals. Uh, and again, from a trading process point of view, it's all well and good to make content and say, well, this is, you know, this is a failed breakdown and therefore it's bullish. But then in terms of building a position, what does that mean, right? Does that mean you enter a market here and have a stop at the low? Doesn't seem very compelling, right? Um, I think in general, whenever you get these types of failed breakdown structures, uh, you have two options which you could potentially mix together. Uh, option one is to wait for a pullback closer to invalidation and then buy the shit out of that because it, the proximity to invalidation is the highest and the risk reward is the best. Uh, and then position for either kind of a local high in the technical sense or broader trend continuation towards new highs. Now, every trading system, every decision has its pros and cons. So for example, uh, if you were to strictly wait for the pullback, try to get an entry and then continuation, the pros of that approach is that your risk to reward is generally better because you're closer to where you're wrong. So your risk to reward is better. You could really size that up uh, and that there isn't much ambiguity in terms of whether you're right or you're wrong. You'll get pretty quick resolution uh, to that question. Now, the con of that approach is that if the market is really strong, then you get these types of reclaim setups. At most, maybe they consolidate a little bit or dip uh, without reaching the reclaim level and then just shoot off. So at that point, you feel like a bit of a mug because you were like, well, technically, this setup was bullish here on this close, or if you're conservative, you know, on this close or whatever else. Uh, but despite having a bullish directional bias, uh, you know, you essentially planned for an entry that you didn't get. So on the pro side, 
of waiting for the pullback, better risk reward, proximity to validation, and less ambiguity. And on the con side, you don't uh, get a feel if the market is really strong. Uh, but it works the other way around as well, right? Let's say you, you take a systematic uh, approach in some sense, and your argument is clear close through resistance, even if it was, you know, if, even if you didn't like this close, clear close through resistance, uh, I'm just going to buy the thing because I assume it's going to at least test resistance, but probably just break and go higher from a trend continuation point of view. The pros of that approach is that you're guaranteed an entry, right? So you're not at risk of not uh, having a position when you have a directional bias, and that's a strong pro. But the con of that approach is that uh, the risk to reward is generally lower, and the proximity to invalidation is also further. So if you were to, for example, just break out by this daily close, and then the market starts to consolidate and even dip a little bit and even retest support, at that point, you're under a lot of pressure where technically you should be... Uh, potentially making a bet based on proximity to validation. So uh, the cost of those types of momentum breakout entries is that, I mean, if you're wrong, you lose money, that's trading. But it also means that if the market starts to approach the area where your risk to reward is optimized, uh, there's a chance that you are in the worst possible position as opposed to being in the best possible position. So again, pros, cons, trade-offs, that's, that's essentially trading, but that's at the very least how I think about uh, these types of fast-moving failed breakdown setups. Now you could, do a sort of hybrid approach where you take a systematic entry based on a daily weekly close through the level uh, for some percentage of the position you want to build uh, and then you leave limit orders and or you know sort of put, put some capital away uh, to add to that position uh, if it makes that dip and attempts to make a higher low and pulls back and does whatever uh, in general i think that can work but i'm not a huge fan of splitting orders uh, especially if my average entry is going to get worse, not better. Uh, but that is something you can do if you want to kind of tick both boxes. But as always, there's even a trade-off with that, that if you're trying to get the best of both worlds, you don't. You get the best of neither, right? Uh, if it ends up being a ripper, then the p traders who are taking the systematic signals uh, are going to have a better entry than you and a probably a larger position as well. Um, and if it ends up dipping to the support and bouncing, then the traders who were sort of patient and waited for the high-low are going to have a better entry than you and less drawdown in the trade itself. So again, all about pros, cons, trade-offs, etc. But that's just some rolling commentary on how to interpret these failed breakdown structures. Like it's all well and good that the market closes above a failed breakdown level. That gives you a directional bias. But how to action that directional bias in terms of structuring a trade or taking an entry uh, is a entirely different beast you know it's all well and good to say this looks this looks good but at the end of the day you need to open a position uh, if you want to make some money and that's where i think most of your efforts should be directed towards so apologies if that's rambly uh, please let me know if you're listening to this whether you enjoy these um i guess tangents different sort of little things to speak about in between uh charts if you just want the chart view i will happily do that but i think there's honestly more value um in the discussion but that's just my bias i can make these videos shorter this channel is for you the the listener the audience at the end of the day so let me know what you want to see um in line with that theme pepe is another one a uh, strong performer today up 15 percent similar type of uh failed breakdown structure i'd say around 6 30 ish uh, even if you want to be a bit more conservative and pick the higher up level that would take you to 660, so sort of 630 to 660. Uh, and the same arguments apply there. So you can just rewatch the previous section uh, and hopefully make some sense of it. But technically, uh, very similar plus strong performer on the day. And you can see the low time frames reflect that view as well. Uh, say is there, I think a couple of these are a little bit more ambiguous, but in general, uh, thematically, very similar. I'm quite happy with the cluster at 56 to 60 cents. Um, as a similar analogous failed breakdown structure and same considerations apply. Also good performer for the day and so a lot of altcoin charts irrespective of your watch list uh, are starting to look like this or at least approaching those types of levels. Uh, there's a bit of dispersion where the stronger alts have cleared those flaws and the weaker alts are approaching them um, and I've obviously opted to go for the stronger ones with a sort of emphasis on uh, those who those alts which have done well today and structurally just look better. Um, Sheeb is another one based on performance and also some price action type of stuff. I think there's a news catalyst here, which I, I don't love as much when you get a um, news-based 
break out and reclaim, especially if price doesn't really fly away from the level. Uh, there's always a risk that news retraces and then you essentially ha you hallucinate a technical setup driven by short term news flows. But nonetheless, if we're going to be consistent and apply the same logic, uh, 2540 on the daily as the range low four hour you can kind of splice it however you like uh, but similar type of argument again um, not to sound like a broken record but we have floor 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 breakdown breakdown doesn't go anywhere it gets back above um, same thing right uh, Solana is one of those that's slightly more ambiguous and isn't quite there yet um, I would say that the four hour level that's worth its metal is if you want to be conservative, it's 170. If you want to be more aggressive, it's 160. So this is one of those in contrast with some of these other lower cap altcoins uh, that hasn't quite breached its floor yet and hasn't done that failed breakdown, broken support, turn to resistance flip yet. Uh, so if you're more of the high cap mind or just a Solana trader in general, I'd look at 160, 170 for that type of setup that we're seeing in some of the stronger performers. Uh, and then if the market shows some weakness, um, I, I wouldn't love to see it go below 153 because then you're not dealing with a uh, reclaim, but rather dealing with a local failed breakout. So I think those are the trading levels for this week on the Solana front. Uh, Whiff has been a pretty weak today. The reason I've still opted to include it uh, is because, as discussed ad nauseam on Casual Friday, uh, it trades very well technically. So just from a TA point of view, line make boing, no thinking, no thoughts, uh, it's still uh, one of the cleaner charts out there. Uh, still the same cluster at $3 to $3.20 uh, that I think is pretty good, and the TA has been bearing that out as well. So I think if you're interested in short to medium term trading, uh, $2.20 to $3 is pretty good good uh, as a range again same thing goes where if, if, if this turns into a failed breakdown type of thing the earliest signal of that would be closing back above 320 and then you're targeting trend continuation in general and perhaps even a break from this entire sideways consolidation so you can kind of move your targets up which is nice um, otherwise even if you take a very conservative um, consolidation based approach uh, there's a lot of space on this chart just because of volatility market cap etc between resistance and support so that i think belongs on any traders watch list uh, that's all i've got time for this evening again sorry the show is late hope you enjoyed it i am desperate for your feedback as to whether you enjoy the uh side content side content and tangents that we go on if we do let me know if you don't let me know uh the show is for you sound like a broken record but i mean i'm, I'm sure you're all used to it at this point apologies that the video is late better late than never i hope Hope you all have a wonderful start to the week. Thank you to Woo for supporting the show. There are some really fun features coming out now that they've moved on from a sort of esoteric PFOF uh, type of model into a proper centralized exchange with diverse liquidity providers. And we look forward to sharing those with you. If you want to be in a position to test out some products and uh, join, join in on some of the fun stuff we'll be doing, uh, it's one way to support the show by the link in the description if you want to sign up and check it out. Otherwise, just like the video and stuff. That's free and leave me a comment. Uh, I'm going to stop rambling. Hope you all have a wonderful day and I'll see you in the comments section. Bye-bye.